Welcome to Careers Unwrapped, where we delve into real-life career stories from successful people who've been through it all, the ups and the downs. We'll get their raw, honest, actionable advice and be the careers talk they wish they'd had when they started out. As someone who has had a varied career, from soldier to salesman, expedition leader to entrepreneur, he knows firsthand that your career doesn't always lead you where you expect it to. Here's your host, Mark Fawcett. So hello and welcome to Careers Unwrapped. I'm your host, Mark Force, and with me today is Claire. Claire is Director of Freel Consulting. She advises construction firms. She's also the founder of Construction Anglia, and she's been awarded one of the top 100 most influential women in construction. We'll dig into that in a bit more detail. But she's also previously worked in a whole variety of fields from gallery assistants, consulting and marketing. And she's going to be talking to us about how she moved and transitioned through these various roles at different points in her life about her career and what lessons she's learned along the way that we might all benefit from. So, Claire, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I think let's just start with the big picture of construction, why you started down that route and what were the first steps you took? So back in, I can't remember what year it was, so I worked in construction recruitment and I loved the construction side of it, but wasn't so keen on the recruitment side. So there was a job that came up working for a groundworks contractor locally as their business development manager. So I knew that if I sent my CV over to them, they probably wouldn't even bother seeing me. So I gave them the call and I was like, I'm going to apply for this job. This is why I think I'm suitable for this role. Please give me a chance, basically. And they did. So that's how I initially kind of got working directly for a contractor. And so what was that first job? What were your responsibilities there? So in the construction industry, obviously different contract- subcontractors need work from main contractors. So my role was to build relationships with main contractors, whether they were house builders or more commercial outfits. And then I would kind of manage the relationships to the point of getting tenders in. Then if they won the work, kind of manage it moving forward from there as well. So it was just constantly looking for their next job and making sure the jobs that they were doing were they were doing well. And- Perhaps for people who are thinking, I wonder if construction is a sector for me, can you help try and break it down a little bit? Because construction includes massive infrastructure projects like HS2 down to having that extension put on your house. And so how do you describe the overall construction sector? So for me, I'd had quite a few careers or many careers, worked in many industries before that. And I think the thing about the construction industry is whether it is, like you say, the infrastructure projects or the construction projects where they build things from scratch, it's the fact that you play a role in something that is going to be there forever. It's a legacy piece. So it is really good fun. You get to meet a lot of amazing people. And the misconception of, or maybe the stereotypes that are wrong, like I've never felt so welcomed and comfortable in an industry because they're kind of working in office environments before sales, office environments and things like that. It was just a really nice community. It's got a real community feel. Because some women listening might think, hang on, construction seems very blokey, very male, a bit of a lad's environment. But you're saying you actually felt more welcome, more comfortable there than you did in office environments. Yeah, I did. Like, Don't get me wrong, the majority of my work in construction is in the office. Well, now it is 100% in the office. But actually, I've worked in environments before where they're very sales, KPI driven, and the office environment can be very toxic. Whereas what I found with the construction industry is that, yeah, people were just kind of very authentic. And if there was an issue that's kind of come to you with it and you'd resolve it rather than it wasn't as catty, it's from my side of it. <laughs> and so if somebody's thinking, okay, actually, I'm quite interested in construction overall, how do they start? How do they find out what might be good for them? I think if you speak to as many people as possible, work out what you're skill is whether you're kind of better out speaking to whether you want to be outside whether you want to be on site whether you want to be in the office because there's so many different roles within the industry that you could get into so whether it's because obviously mine's business development and marketing but I've got friends who are quantity surveyors I've got friends that are site managers so actually where are you most comfortable and in that context one of the things you've done is you've set up the construction anglia so perhaps tell us a bit more about what that is so there's a lot of good news and a, a lot goes on in the construction industry. And when I started my marketing agency, I couldn't find anywhere like local papers wouldn't necessarily be interested in covering and sharing the news. 
because it's not relevant to them all the time. It's more relevant to the industry. So I set up Construction Anchor as a new sharing platform for the east of England. And how's that doing now? Yeah, it's doing really well. We get lots of stories come in and basically we just publish them on behalf of people. The only thing that my only kind of rule on publishing it is that it can't be very salesy. <laughs> and the industry overall is often in the news from a political context and particularly with an election year that we're most likely in right now. What do you think governments need to be doing to boost British construction, both from an actual construction perspective, but also as a place for people to work? Well, I think it is a kind of from government, but grassroots as well. I think for me personally, it wasn't promoted as a career at school. It was kind of the industry or you're not very academic and you can go into that. So it's the government need to invest in kind of raising awareness of all the opportunity, but also from a point of view of kind of supply chain and finances to make sure that because the amount of construction companies that go under and it's because they get impacted by what they have to outlay at the beginning and if they don't get paid on time then obviously that affects their cash flow so I'm looking at that more holistically as well. And you mentioned then about it not being promoted when you're at school so let's sort of dial the time machine back a little bit and when you were actually at school what were the careers that were put forward to you what level career advice if any did you get what was on your mind about what you wanted to do for a job so i think kind of like your standard careers not sure that they're standard but the ones that were like teachers accountant those kind of careers are the ones that put to the forefront as opposed to other routes and some careers didn't even exist then they exist now and if you could give some advice to your younger self what advice do you think you might give now with the hindsight of the work you have done I just say don't panic. And I mean, I say don't panic, but my son's 15. I keep asking him what he wants to be and he can't tell me. But I think it's that thing of don't be afraid to give a few things a go. And yeah, you have to decide now. Just it's about you can evolve in your career. Like I started off in television production, which is so far removed from what I'm doing now. And along the way, then, have there been people who've influenced you? Positives, mentors, perhaps? Yeah. And I don't know if I've had any mentors along the way but I've had people that I've worked for that I've learned stuff from people I've worked for I've learned kind of good things from and also I think I've learned more from the mistakes in my career than I have from the wins well people are always interested to hear that I think let's draw out a little bit about the mistakes what's one that comes to mind where you now look back in hindsight and go well that was a mistake but I learned so much from it yeah I mean I'm not gonna lie I was a job hopper so if I don't like something I just leave so I think my CV was very colourful in my in my early years, but actually from each of the jobs I looked back and I learned something like some of the jobs that I had, I got bullied at work and actually I learned quite a lot from that and bringing that into having my own business. I want to make sure that no one that works with me or for me feels ever feels that way. Yeah, I find that strikes core cool with me as well because when I set up my business, We Are Futures now, 20 years ago, I remember writing down things that I wanted it to feel like to be there, taking both positives and negatives from previous work environments and saying, well, look, if I'm going to go to the hassle and the trouble and the risk of doing something myself, it better be a place that I actually want to work in. So what do you think are the characteristics that you have tried to create across Frill Consulting, across Construction Anglia? What do you try and make it feel like to work with you? just want um, people to be empowered and also never feel I don't like the culture where people throw people under buses so if someone makes a mistake or if there's something we could have done better we learn from it it's not a case of finger pointing and also work-life balance making sure that obviously work is important but life outside of work is more important. And how do you handle that in reality when you're under pressure for a big pitch a big project maybe a big construction job's about to start? So we just all come together as a team, really. And then if we do, I always make sure it balances out. So if there is the odd time that we do have to put the extra hours in, make sure that people get it back. And if there is something like, if a mistake's been made, let's not worry about how it happened, let's fix it. And then we'll figure it out and make sure it doesn't happen again. So this has put you in positions of leadership. And obviously you have worked in environments where there have been other leaders around you. What have your overall experiences of leadership, good and bad, taught you? What leadership lessons do you take forward? I think it's just to be fair and to listen to people and also to get to know the people you work with. You're in work a majority of your day and you want people to 
actually enjoy what they do rather than come in and kind of dread walking in the door in the morning. So um, just getting to know who you're working with, I think is the biggest thing. What do you think sometimes, therefore, are some of the misconceptions around what it's like to be a leader? It's not easy at all. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the bad experiences and bad managers that I've had in the past, I can kind of appreciate why, they're ways, why they were the way they were. <laughs> but yeah, it, yeah, there's never two days the same. And also you can be doing the doing and then you get pulled away to do something else. Do you think there are, are things that career starters can do to actually develop their leadership skills? Because I think a lot of people's leadership development happens almost by accident. They're promoted or they decide to set something up and therefore they have to lead. So for better or worse, they get on with it. But it's still a skill you can develop. So what about somebody who's in their late teens, early 20s? Are there things they can do to develop leadership? Yeah, there's a lot of courses out there that they can put themselves on and also observing people. I think LinkedIn is a great thing for kind of watching people's journey and picking up on what they've done in the past and the way they operate now. And are, are there any particular leaders that you look at or watch or read about, whether on LinkedIn or elsewhere, that you think actually that they've got it? Yeah, Stephen Bartlett, is it? That podcast, I really like his style. He comes across really well. And it's also, he also comes across very authentic. Yeah, a natural communicator, I think, as well. So just going back to, you describe yourself as a job hopper. And your first job then was working in television production. What happened after that? Um, so after that, so I had my daughter when I was at school in sixth form. So my kind of, what I wanted to do when I left school, that all changed because I left school with the child essentially I had it was me my daughter and three A levels so I decided that I didn't want to kind of fall into the stereotypical teen you know single mum category so my mum and dad supported me to go out to work so I went up to commute up to London and worked in television production but I did that for two years and then it became too much because I was always away on location and it was never a nine to five so that's when I had to make the decision to kind of jack in that career and come back so I just got temp agency work I worked for a shipping company that was horrific and then I got into because that was also a recruitment agency that's when I then got into recruitment and in terms of getting into recruitment did you start in construction or did you start in other sectors no I started in kind of generic recruitment and then I can't remember what year was it 2010 I think I got into like construction recruitment and then carried on from there and then I think I started my job for the construction company in 2016. Right and from there you were named a couple of years ago 2022-23 as one of the 100 most influential women in construction. What did that mean to you and what do you think the influence that you have in construction is? So I've never won anything in my life and so I remember when they called my name, I was really shocked. But I think it comes down to, and I did struggle with it as well, because when I got it, I thought, oh gosh, is there an expectation? Have we got to do more? What is this for? But actually, it kind of, I've got an amazing community of women and men nationally now that I kind of call my friends and we support each other, lift each other up, give each other pep talks whenever times aren't as good. And um, so I think it was just to recognize the impact that, I've had kind of mentoring people along the way. And you said you hadn't won anything before, but also since then, Influencer Awards, Unsung Hero Awards, Ally Awards, all in and around construction. There, there's clearly people in the industry who think that you've got a hugely positive impact upon the industry. And what do you think that impact is? Or what would you like it to be? I think it's all around collaboration and my biggest thing throughout, which is the same throughout all of the kind of industries I've worked in, is connecting people and bringing people together to make things happen, whether it's to bring them together to make a project work, whether it's someone's come to me and said, oh, I think I want to do this. But I've kind of coached them on actually, well, this is the steps you need to take before you can do that. So I think it's the collaboration and a pound piece. And I do do quite a lot going into promote careers in construction in colleges etc and also telling my story and making people know you don't have to go down the kind of what's perceived as the normal route to get to where you want to be and i suspect claire that you're actually sort of underselling it a little bit here in a way 
because it's clear that you both have a a sort of direct and positive influence when you're actually mentoring people, but also an indirectly positive influence just by telling people that there are opportunities for them in this industry. And even with a background that doesn't look an obvious pathway there at the beginning, that there's so much you can achieve in construction, especially if you just if you get stuck into it. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing about all of it and the advice that I give to anyone in starting out in their career is just be nice. Be nice to everyone. Like you never know where you're gonna see these people again. So it's like the the people that I met when I worked as a runner in London when I left school for the television companies then are like big directors of was obviously their names on television <laughs> at the end on the credit. And even people that I went to school with who had now made their way up in the industries that they work in. So actually just keeping those relationships and making sure that you're nice to everyone. And in the industry overall now, how is it changing since you first moved into recruitment and construction about 13, 14, 15 years ago? Are the types of jobs being affected by green technology? Are they being affected by use of AI or other technology? What do you see as the changes coming in the industry? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is tech that's changed. And I think one of the things that I noticed when I set out, so my first company was um, Frill Consulting and we were doing consultancy business development for people. But then the marketing side grew. And when I first set out, people were very much didn't need to market because it was all done on relationships. Whereas now people realize that actually they need to do the marketing side of things. They need to have a presence on LinkedIn. They need to promote what they're doing. They need to showcase their CSR corporate social responsibility that they're doing in order to kind of stay keep their profiles where it needs to be and what do you see as the further developments and changes coming up looking five ten years ahead what's there going to be a need for more of or less of in construction i think well there's a lot around tech and kind of robots taking things etc i can't see that happening but we will we'll see what happens in the future but i think the roles yeah there'll be more digital roles and it's all around kind of next zero etc and actually the impact in communities that they're working in you mentioned obviously i mean a major impact in your life having your daughter while you were still at school and then your parents helping when you first moved into television production how important has family been not to, i don't mean in your life but how important has family been in how you've been able to develop your career yeah i mean the support that my parents gave me if they hadn't have kind of been there for me it would have been a lot harder to carry on and then the nice thing is my daughter's now 20 and she works for me so she's doing a digital marketing apprenticeship and working the business as well so as much as it was hard (laughs) all those years ago it kind of it's come full circle and how how do you think she's taken to working for a mother then i don't know but we don't know any different so when she was at sixth form she'd work a day a week kind of day off that they got during the week and then after she finished sixth form, she looked at potentially going to university and then we looked at degree level apprenticeships and realised she can be debt free, she can get the experience and get a qualification at the end of it. So she that's the route that she went down. Now that's an area we get a lot of questions about these days around degree apprenticeships. So can you perhaps imagine that people are listening, you don't know much about that. Explain from your understanding, both somebody works in construction recruitment, but also as a parent of a daughter going through it, what have you seen around degree apprenticeships? What do you think the good the or the tricky is with them? Again, they weren't promoted when I was at school, so I think they're great. So I started a degree and did a year while working, and it wasn't an apprenticeship. I was at uni and working part-time in retail, and I couldn't balance the two, so I ended up giving up on the degree and still paying off a student loan, which I only probably cleared last year. Which, which was depressing when there's no degree attached to it at all. So I think it's good because you get a real flavour for the industry you want to work in. You get to earn while you learn. And I think you can learn stuff at uni in theory, but practically, like in the workplace, it might be slightly different. So it's nice to bring the theory from uni to work and the actual reality of it to uni. So I think it's really, really good. And in the construction industry do offer a lot of apprenticeship. There is a lot of management training programs out there as well so i know a lot of people that i know started to see their apprenticeships were on management training program and they've ended up with qualifications and progressing so in a way depending on 
kind of what career you want to do. There's certain things that obviously you would have to go to uni for, but actually you can get a three-year head start on your peers by having the industry knowledge and learning at the same time. Yeah, I was talking last week with somebody from an entirely different sector, from finance actually, and they were telling their degree apprentice applicants that if they joined the bank then, took their degree apprentice, meanwhile their friends went off to university, if their friends then came and joined that bank, they would be their bosses because they'd had three years head start and they wouldn't have any debt and they'd still have a degree and they'd have been paid along the way. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. When I took my first job as a runner in London, they, I remember kind of obviously I was going to take it, but I was speaking to people there and a lot of the people that I ended up working with, that was their first job through exposition in university. Whereas for me, I had, I had, I'd come straight from sixth form. So yeah, so it was that experience over qualification. Not that there's anything wrong with going down the university route, but I think there's a lot of value in degree level apprenticeships. Now, a lot of people who don't know you would look at you just from the outside and go, she's successful. She looks like she's got her head screwed on. <laughs> but success means very different things I found during these conversations, very different things to different people. What does success mean to you? Ooh, that's a good question. I think for me, it's having a nice environment that people feel that they can thrive in. I also, my ultimate goal is to be able to be a role model for girls that found themselves in the same situation I did at sick form. And I think it's that thing of, even if you can change one person's life, that's great. Because I didn't have any role models like who were, in my, who were in my situation at school, so I kind of had to figure it out for myself. But I'd have really appreciated someone talking me through it. And how on a practical level do you do that? How do you find, reach out, support a girls or young women who find themselves in the same situation you did at Sixth Form? I think social media is a great thing now. But I think what I've found is over the years, it's really hard to reach those people because obviously it's not something that's promoted as a, you don't want to glamorize, <laughs> make it glamorous. <laughs> but equally, it's very hard to reach out to those people. Yeah. And in terms of success as a businesswoman, outside of the more personal aspects you've just outlined, what does success mean to you in your work? So we work with a lot of different construction clients, delivering good campaigns for them, being kind of ahead of trends, making sure that they're showcasing themselves properly and ultimately um, facilitating them having a really good reputation. And from the successes you've had and also from the fails and the mistakes along the way as well if we could sort of try to start to bottle this up and say right there are three things that have really been core to the way i've learned and developed what three factors do you think have been most important in your development in your growth not being afraid of failure so i'd rather regret something i've done than regret something that i haven't done be kind to people and be authentic to yourself. Always make sure you stick to your values. And do you think there have been times along the way where you have, in hindsight, not done that? Where you've looked back and said, I let myself down there? I think it's one of the biggest things. Another thing is going with your gut. And I think there's times where I would have known that I shouldn't have done something, whether it's take a client on or take a project on. And I've known it wasn't going to work and I should have just said no, but I went against my gut that would be it that is so familiar i definitely recall early stages when often because you just feel the business needs the money or the revenue that might come in you take on a job or as you say you take on a client and you think oh we need the money let's do it and then when that gut feeling is there normally it ends up being right doesn't it <laughs> i just think it wasn't worth it and i think the other one i found as well is making the tricky decisions quickly and often when i think right this is not a pleasant decision it might involve someone who works for you it might involve a project thing i've got to I've got to do something about this when you actually then commit and do it i think the only regret i've ever had is should have done it sooner yeah that's it isn't it like sometimes you'll lay awake at night thinking about something and then actually that was probably worse than actually doing it <laughs> 
Yes, definitely. Because at least once you've done it, you almost live it twice. <laughs> and the longer the period before you actually do the unpleasant thing, it just sort of builds up, doesn't it, in you a tension or a feeling. And then you've done it like, it wasn't nearly as hard as I thought it might be. Exactly that. And so what's the future hold? What are, if we talk again in a year or two, Claire, what are we going to be talking about? Um, hopefully, so I shrank the business last last year. So we want, we're moving offices. So we've got big growth plans for the next few years. So yeah, hopefully maybe a couple more branches of real across the country. I should touch on this earlier, but how was COVID from a construction recruitment perspective? Obviously, we're not recruitment, we're in marketing. So, yeah, it was the first, because it kicked off in March, didn't it? And it was just phone call after phone call of people like, we need to cut our budgets. And marketing is always the first thing to go. But then kind of a month down the line, people then realized that everyone was going online. So it was key that they were present online. So we did a lot of free workshops for companies during that time. Yeah, we did dip a little bit. But then after that, it kind of rapidly went up again. And so that sort of, Pivoting, I think, is what defined the companies that succeed and survive during COVID. So your free workshops online. Yeah, it was horrific, to be fair, because I had a business partner and we went our separate ways in the January. So I was just kind of recovering from that. And then COVID hit. And like, is there anything else I can have in the first two years of business testing me? But how much stronger do you think you'll be when other decisions come up in the future, other problems? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think if you can get through that, you can get through anything, can't you? And I think the biggest thing when COVID hit, one of my biggest frustrations was the lack of clarity around construction working on site, like whether they were key workers or not, etc. And I remember reaching out to our local MP and you couldn't get a definitive answer. But obviously it just carried on. At that very time, just as the lockdown came, we had just had our whole kitchen knocked down because we were having a new kitchen put in. And so all of the workers said, right, we've got to go. And we, <laughs> we don't have a kitchen. You can't just go. And actually, the only two people who stayed around for a while were two roofers who every day would just be sitting on top of the roof, putting their tiles in, singing to each other. But everybody else was unsure and, and left. So I can imagine from someone within the industry, that must have been a time of extreme uncertainty and difficulty. Yeah, and I think... A few people kind of stuck down tools, but then they quickly got on with it again on the bigger project. Yeah. Well, look, Claire, this has been really interesting and such a sort of diverse conversation about both how you started out, both from having your daughter at Sixth and College and moving into TV production, then other routes before coming into recruitment, and construction and marketing. Also, your thoughts about construction overall and the different routes and opportunities within that. But I'm also very much struck by your three or the three sort of core parts of an ethos if you want about not being afraid of failure being kind being authentic and how those are foundations of a lot of who you are at work but it also seems to me perhaps who you are outside of work as well so thank you so much for joining us this morning i've got one final question as part of us passing the baton of careers experience and careers advice onwards is there somebody else who you think would be really interesting, really useful to get them and their story onto Careers Unwrapped? Yeah, there's a lady called Sophie Alexander. She's just started Mindfulness for Children company and she's also an expert in place and place shaping. <laughs> and she's amazing. Her story is amazing. Brilliant. Sophie Alexander. Well, we will be going for Sophie. Claire, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really interesting. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. This podcast is sponsored by We Are Futures. To find out more about We Are Futures and how we can introduce your brand, business or organisation to the mass markets of tomorrow, visit www.wearefutures.com. Make sure to search for Careers Unwrapped in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Remember to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at We Are Futures, thanks for listening.